good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. Will you turn to your neighbor today? Will you pass the peace of Christ amongst your family? In the name of the Lord. In
carry their wooden idols and pray to gods that cannot save. Consult together, argue your case, get together, decide what to say. Who made these things known so long ago? What idol ever told you they would happen? Was it not I, the Lord? For there is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. Let all the world look to me for salvation, for I am God. There is no other. I have sworn by my own name. I have spoken the truth, and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. The people will declare the Lord is the source of all my righteousness and strength.
yield up ourselves. And in heart, mind, and soul, we come to the altar. Say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, renew me. Lord, give your life to me. Would you stand with me this morning as we go to prayer? As we stand, if there's anyone this morning who has need to love to come to the altar, we would love for you to come. Just now we open up the altar. Join us here. Let's avail ourselves of this special moment of God's people in God's house on God's day. In the presence of God who died and rose again for us. We bow. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Lord, the invitation of Scripture is, Come. Come so that we can be forgiven of all the wrong and evil things we've done in our lives. Come so that we can be clean, cleansed, and made fresh and new on the inside. Come so that our darkness might be dissipated in your light. Come that a meaningless life might know purpose and meaning in Jesus Christ. Come that we might know what a pure life is. Come that we might know what a life of love is. And who we are, Lord, lost in our own darkness, and wondering what love truly is about, wishing we could start over and have a pure, clean life again. And then you come. Jesus happens. And you turn on the lights. And you wash away our sin. And the things we can't even forgive ourselves, you say, I forgive you. And when we had no life, you give us life. For that reason, Lord, we come this morning. Around this room, I know there are many, many needs. We can't take time to list them all. There are those that, that hurt and suffer in their own bodies, their own minds and hearts. There are those that hurt and suffer on behalf of another. There are those who suffer from loneliness this morning because they're separated from their spouse. There are those that suffer with ailments of the body. There are those that have need beyond sheer. So each of us, Lord, we know. We're very careful in this moment to lay aside our distractions, to put down our agendas, and we just say, here are my Lord. Help me. Touch me. Fill me. Forgive me. Renew me. And above all, Lord, help me follow you. But when it comes down to the end of the day, we have come to do your will, to be your people. We come, Lord, for that transformation. Blend us into your body. Make us one with you. Join us together into your church that all of us may not just come to you, but we may follow you. That we might obey the great words that go from Genesis to Revelation, the one words that came from the mouth of Jesus himself. Follow me. I guess, Lord, what that means is we've come to follow. Move around this room just now. Help us not to be distracted by our frustrations and our hurts and our needs, our anxieties and our fears and our wounds and our angers and our resentments. Lord, let us lay these things at your altar. That's part of why we come. And in the coming and the giving up of these things, Lord, let us have the faith, the hope, the love for you to follow. And to live a life worthy of the calling we've received in Christ Jesus. Bring us to be your healing, your help, your gentleness, your forbearance and patience. Grant us the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Renew us in faith and hope. Through it all, Lord, meet our needs, lead us along, even as we follow.
You know the ones that are on our prayer list in the bulletin, Lord. I won't name them all, but we just pray your grace upon each according to the need. We lift up Pastor Barb as she comes to break the bread of life with us this morning. We lift up all of our pastors here today. What a fortunate group we are to have joy such a wonderful pastoral staff. Grant each one the grace to lead us, Lord, to your throne and to make us better followers. Those in military, Jesus, hope bless them. They're our heroes. We're far from them right now. We just ask your blessing, protection, and grace upon them. Help them serve with courage and honor and bravery. But also, Lord, help them complete the mission to come home. We lift up those many ones with health issues and concerns and ask that you anoint them with oil of healing and hope. And Lord, even now, come. As we've come for you, you now come for us. Join yourself to us. Fill us with your grace. Hover over us with mercy. Renew us in hope. And Lord, overflow us with your love. Please remain standing as the pastor comes. We're going to anoint one of our own for healing this morning. Thank you, Bruce. A new member of our church family, the Minos, Angie, just Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, was diagnosed with a breast cancer and an aggressive kind. And I've asked her to come, if you would just come here, Angie, before us, and for her church family to gather around her as we anoint her with oil and ask for God's healing.
children. Our children are dismissed at this time to go downstairs and continue their worship with Pastor John down there while Pastor Barb preaches to us today. And uh, as you can tell, you did not want to listen to me today. So we're so glad that we had this scheduled one like this. And Pastor Barb, come and share with us. Thank you, Pastor. So many of you may recognize this picture behind us. The facts of life, right? You take the good, you take the bad. You take them both and there you have the facts of life. The facts of life. There's a time you got to go and show your grown up now you know about the facts of life. The facts of life. When the world never seems to be living up to your dreams, and suddenly you're finding out the facts of life are all about you. You. Right? Isn't that kind of how that song goes? Okay. My voice was pretty bad today, too, so I apologize. But. Some of you are familiar with this 80s sitcom, The Facts of Life. Um, it ran on NBC from August of 79, I believe, until May of 88. And I'm not sure how this name came about. However, if you've seen the show, you know that the characters in the show dealt with a lot of different issues um, that life kind of threw at them as they were growing up. Um, and I remember watching many of these episodes and enjoyed the dismiss of personality between the girls and their house mom and Mrs. Garrett. Okay, am I the only one that watched this show? Come on, Mrs. Garrett? <laughs> really? <laughs> Hi, okay, good, Angie, I'm glad. <laughs> good, everybody's so okay, we have the show, okay, good. Um, so there are these four main characters, right? Um, we have the spoiled rich girl, Blair, right? <laughs> We have um, the sweet and personable Natalie. Remember Natalie? And then, of course, there was the gossipy youngest one, Tootie. And the Bronx tough girl, Joe, right? All four of these girls. It was just awesome. Um, and the thing that I appreciated most about this show is that Mrs. Garrett, she seemed to love all four of these girls equally, right? And she did her best to guide them whether or not their behavior was good or bad. She was always trying to help them in the right way. And how she plays her character reminds me somewhat of how a shepherd leads his or her sheep. Um, so, before we go too much further, let's go ahead and recite our motto together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want in my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I still wish I knew who wrote that. Was it you, Pastor Nathan? Okay, okay. So, hi. I just, I love that. It just really centers the same so I, I love that. So, the title of today's sermon, I've kind of stolen from, obviously, the theme song. Um, the Facts of Life as a Sheep. And our scripture lesson is found in the book of Ezekiel. And for those who may not be familiar with this book, Ezekiel is found in the Old Testament. It is following Lamentations and preceding Daniel. Uh, did you all know that the name Ezekiel means strengthened by God? I found that really interesting when I came across this. Um, and then Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, was a prophet during the time of the Babylonian exile. Ezekiel was among the Jews who were carried away from Jerusalem during Nebuchadnezzar's first victory over the city. And while Jeremiah continued to minister to 
the few and the poor who had been left behind, Isaiah Dion was engaged behind the scenes with the captives and contended against the false prophets and against the false hopes of the people. The people who gave no evidence of repentance. So if you found Ezekiel, we will be in chapter 34, and this is going to be verses 11 through 16, and then we're going to move forward to verses 20 to 24, and I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version in, uh, wow, brain freeze this morning. Wow, 50 is hit big time. <laughs> Sorry about that, Diane. Diane will have the, uh, the words up on the screen, too, if you don't have the new revised standard. Whoa, well, that's bad. Sorry. <laughs> um, so once again, we're reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. And then we're going to be dropping down verses 20 through 24. And now we begin our reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As the shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. And then skipping down to verse 20. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with the flank and the shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be, thanks be to God. Sometimes with the... the the word gives us is not necessarily a pleasant thought, as we just read here. Um, so before we continue, let's, let us pray. Lord, this morning, uh, may we acknowledge you as our sovereign shepherd. May we, as the sheep of your pasture, listen to the voice of your spirit. And may we obediently follow your call upon our lives as your son Jesus did. May you grant your servant the words of wisdom that you have for us today. And it's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I realize this morning that most of us probably haven't spent a lot of time as a shepherd, me included, However, this is a common biblical metaphor that can be difficult for us in the 21st century to understand if we don't take some time. So I think that an understanding of a shepherd might be beneficial for us, especially as this metaphor is used not just
just in our passage today, but it's actually used throughout scripture, and we find examples in the gospel. And one example is where we hear Jesus talking, and he says in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, for the sheep. And we also find it quoted often in the uh, Psalm 23. So if I'm not a shepherd, I did a little bit of research. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like that. I like to kind of take things apart and analyze and figure out all the little pieces and get them all together. So bear with me this morning. If you're not one of those folks, just say, get to the facts and move on, right? I, I have to kind of know all the facts behind it. So I found this YouTube clip of an Italian shepherd, and he was talking about the job skills that are needed in his line of work. Now don't worry, I'm not going to bore you this morning with a 15-minute video in Italian with English subtitles, okay? I'm not going to do it to you. Um, however, <laughs> some of the skills that were mentioned include the ability to work hard. Sounds like a shepherd, right? Able to handle multiple demands. Well, yeah, usually there's more than one sheep in that sheepfold, right? There's usually quite a few. Um, the ability to work in all kinds of weather. Let's see, there's snow, rain, weather, heat, right? All kinds of weather. Those of you who work outside throughout the year, you kind of understand that. You know, it's not necessarily easily, and sometimes the weather can be hard to predict. You just don't know what's going to happen. Boom, it's raining. Especially in Kansas, right? <laughs> So we have the weather, and then the need to be willful and decisive. Okay, we're leading a whole bunch of sheep. Might be, might be handy, right? Committed it to the role. Okay. Afraid of nothing. If you guys remember the story of uh, David, right? He had the five the lions and, yeah, right? All those things, right? So afraid of nothing would be a good thing. Um, able to be a reference point in those times of danger. Consistent and trustworthy. Now, it's quite a list, and these facts of life for the shepherd give us additional insight into our passage today. Another challenge that we have today, however many years later it is, 3,000 or 4,000 or whatever, somebody who is a, who's a historian will have to correct me because I just know it's a long time ago, um, is that the lectionary has kind of dropped us into the middle of Ezekiel's message. And you've said it not just once, but twice. So we really do need to kind of get ourselves back into the proper context. And so we're going to go in another chapter. And in verse 1, we find that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And this is something that I learned in a class a few months back or whatever it was, that this phrase, the word of the Lord came to, is one of several phrases that are used by the prophets to help to communicate to those who heard the prophecies long ago, as well as for those of us who read it today, that this definitely is the word of the Lord. The clues to the listener and to us, to the reader. That what the prophet's about to say <coughs> is a message directly from God Almighty. It's, it's not something that that this um, that Ezekiel just kind of dreamed up and said, hey, you know, uh, I think this might be good for y'all to hear, right? And it's something that God told him to tell the people. <coughs> so as we continue, though, it might be helpful for us to think of this passage in terms of a courtroom scene. Anybody ever been in court and served like this, like a juror or something like that? Or yeah, not much fun, right? But you know, we're citizens. We do our part, right? It's part of what it is, right? It's part of what we do as, as people of God is that we we do what we're called to do and we do what the Lord has asked us to do to a certain extent. Um, so it is, so think about this as a courtroom scene because we find God telling Ezekiel. What he wants Ezekiel to, to Ezekiel to do in the first part of this verse here. 
um, a verse two. It says, moral prophecy prophesied against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds. So here it is. God's telling Ezekiel what to say to the shepherds. Right? Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And prophesy and say to them, the uh, shepherds. Okay, so he's talking to the shepherds. And as we continue with the remainder of verse 2 and go through verse 6, we see that Ezekiel records the Lord's opening prosecution remarks. Okay? We're starting this out. And, and, and the Lord says, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, you have not bound up the injured, you have not brought back the strayed, you have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and scattered they became food for the wild animals. My sheep were scattered. They were wandered all over the mountains and on every hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with no one to search or seek for them. As Ezekiel continues into verses 7 through 10 with the Lord's charges against the shepherds for their lack of care and also gives a foreshadow of the fact that judgment will be pronounced against these shepherds with the following. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild animals, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep. Wow, I'll try saying that five times. Yeah. Um, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed the sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding. Of these sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not eat food for them. So does knowing this background help you all a little bit to understand this first portion of our scripture passage today as we kind of know what led up to this passage? So let's go back to our shepherd friend. Okay, Remember his list there? One of the things that we learned was that the shepherds needed to be committed to the role that they must carry out, right? And based upon our Lord's prosecution remarks, the shepherds that the Lord had given to his sheep, the people of Israel, well, these shepherds were only interested in whatever advantages that they could possibly receive from their role as a shepherd without actually doing the job of a shepherd, right? The shepherds were not feeding the sheep by leading them to green pastures. They were taking advantage of the sheep by using their wool and slaughtering the sheep that had become fat. They didn't bother to strengthen the weaker sheep or care for the wounded, and they couldn't be bothered to call those who had strayed away from the fold. And the sheep that were lost, well, they were never sought after. No wonder we find in verses 11 through 16 that the Lord has decided that he himself will be the shepherd to his people, the Israelites. And then as we continue this chapter, we find the following in verses 17 through 19. As for you, my flock, okay, so he's not dead here, right? He talked to the shepherds, now he's talking to the sheep. As for you, my flock, Thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between the sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. It is not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you must tread down the feet, the rest of your pasture. Tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture. Sorry about that. 
When you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet?
As one thinks about several of the leaders in the Israelite history, we find Moses was a shepherd before God called him to lead the people out of bondage in Egypt. The fact that Abraham had many herds is found in the story of Lot and Abraham. Remember? They agreed to part their separate ways as their people, the shepherds, were fighting over the land. And who could possibly forget King David? As the youngest, he was chosen to serve as his family's tender of the sheep. When Samuel came to town to anoint a new king, We clearly see that God is not happy with the leadership in Israel and how these leaders have not used their role as shepherd of the nation in a responsible manner. Basically, they have exploited the people as if the flock belonged to them, the shepherds. But the people were the Lord's flock. Remember he says, my sheep in verse 6? And the kings ruled them by the Lord's appointment, as we found in verse 8. Do y'all remember that list of complaints that Ezekiel had listed? The shepherds had neglected to feed the sheep. They took advantage of the sheep. They didn't strengthen the weakened sheep. They didn't care for the wounded. They didn't call back those who had strayed. And the lost were not being found. Folks, the leaders of the day were the shepherds, and the Israelite people were the sheep. In the passage today. Today, there are some important points for us to understand from this passage. First of all, we, the church, are the shepherds. And the world around us are the sheep. Right? Y'all are quiet this morning. Maybe it's me, okay? <laughs> the facts of life for the church are that we are the ones that God has given responsibility for those who are lost and wounded and those that have strayed away from the fold of the church. Second, not only are we the shepherd, but we are also the sheep. And the Lord is our shepherd. Do y'all remember Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Such a beautiful passage and a reminder that He is with me. Us. He, our shepherd, is with us. He has not left us. We are not like the sheep in the days of Ezekiel that the shepherds have not been with. He is with us. So some of the questions for us today that, that we, we might need to kind of grapple with as we're kind of wrestling with this passage is that how are, how are we doing? Are, are we feeding the sheep? Are we feeding those among us? Because remember we're a shepherd and sheep. Are we feeding those among us? Are we taking the time to strengthen each other? 
How about those that are wounded? There's lots of people that are wounded. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, uh, one of our short soldiers that has been wounded in battle, right? There's lots of people that are wounded here. A lot of people that we come into contact are wounded. Life is not easy. And how about those who have strayed from us? You know, maybe we haven't seen them for a while. Uh, maybe it's been a couple of weeks since we've seen them at church. Maybe it's our neighbor and we haven't seen them in a while. Have we taken the time to go check in on them? See what's going on? Are, are we being both shepherd and sheep that we're called to be? How about those who have not heard at all? Are we being a faithful witness to our neighbors and to the strangers that we meet throughout the week? Are we really sharing God's love with them? Are we sharing the light that he's given to us to give to them? The good news is, guys, um, the Lord has given us time. We, we may have failed in the past, but we do not have to continue to fail. We, we can show that we are growing. Remember the song? Growing at the path of life, right? Right? Growing? That's what we're supposed to be doing here at Um So as we enter into Advent, there is no better time for us to share. As we go back to that theme song again, um, that second phrase kind of goes, there's a time you got to go and show you're growing now you know about the facts of life. The facts of life. When the world never seems to be living up to your dreams, and suddenly you're finding out the facts of life are all about you. Right? Well, the facts of life are about you and me. And we, as the church, are both shepherd and sheep. And as we grow, we're to be sharing that good news with others. Jesus, our good shepherd, has come. He's come. He's here. He's with us. He's present. He's come. And we are the sheep of his pasture. Folks, he will take care of us. Our needs will be met. That's part of that blessing. Remember the covenant blessing we talked about? That's true for us today, too. God's with us. He'll take care of our needs. Before we close today, um, just a few minutes to think about this here a little bit. I know it's kind of tough to grapple around. I, you know, I had the benefit of time to study, right, and reading it and all that. Um, just a few things here. Just a few minutes to think about this. We are the sheep. We're also the shepherd. As we prepare to stand for the benediction, let us not forget that he is present with us. He will help us and lead us and guide us in our role as shepherd as well as sheep. Let us remember the 
Lord is our shepherd. He will meet our needs. He will give us rest in green pasture and by still waters. He will restore our soul and lead us. Go in the knowledge that he has come and will be our Sorry, you're dismissed. <laughs>